I'm indeed very honored and delighted to be speaking uh, at this consortium event today. Um, it's it's such a happy feeling to see so many familiar faces. Um, it just uh, gives me a sense of what we have been missing over past uh, nearly two years now uh, due to COVID. I hope that one day we'll be able to meet in person again. But uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, um, and today, the topic that I'll be talking about is hijacking of evidence-based medicine. And I'll be trying to give some examples from oncology um, in order to lead the audience to think about whether evidence-based medicine has actually been hijacked uh, and how it has been hijacked uh, and what we can do about it. Uh, but before going into uh, the details, I need to disclose that uh, my salary support comes uh, partly through Ontario Institute of uh, Cancer Research, which is funded by the government of Ontario, and I have also received consulting fees from Vivio Health. Uh, so I think we all know about this classic evidence-based uh, medicine pyramid, where uh, randomized controlled trials uh, are considered the, the, the top-level evidence and systematic reviews and meta-analysis from randomized controlled trials um, become the pinnacle of the evidence, whereas non-randomized trials and other uh, studies go towards the bottom. But I think now what's happening is through different methods, this pyramid is being attacked and in a sense hijacked because people are trying to use randomized trials and, and meta-analysis that are faulty to give a false sense of impression of high quality evidence when it's not uh, actually a high quality evidence. So how is that happening? I'll try to go into detail about it. But I think uh, basically there are three ways um, that I see uh, how EBM is being attacked or hijacked. One is there are several flaws in trial design that leads to exaggeration of benefits in, in randomized trials. Um, and second is there is a tendency to get rid of randomized trials altogether. And third is there are flaws in reporting uh, trials. So I'll try to go um, briefly uh, about each of them, uh, about uh, what are the flaws in trial design that can uh, lead to exaggeration of benefit uh, from randomized trials or how we are trying to get rid of randomized trials altogether and uh, issues with uh, reporting of uh, clinical trials. I mean, I'll not have enough time to discuss about meta-analysis today, um, but uh, I have also, or the ESMO uh, team, um, ESMO MCBS team, of which I am also a member, uh, we have recently published uh, this paper, which is an open access paper about biases in study design implementation and data analysis issues, um, in which we also discuss these issues in, in quite detail. If uh, someone wants to, uh, take a look into it uh, later, where we discuss several design implementation and analysis issues that distort the appraisal of evidence from clinical trials, especially in oncology. So about issues with trial design, uh, about issues with uh, uh, flaws in randomized uh, trials. The first is the issue with uh, the use of appropriate endpoint. And especially in oncology, our field has been flooded with the use of surrogate endpoints. And why is this a problem? So we use several surrogate endpoints in cancer clinical trials, like response rate, PFS, DFS, event-free survival, pathological complete response, and so on, which is fine. But the issue uh, is, are they actually validated surrogate? Of course, there is an argument to be made for increasing use of surrogate endpoints because the use of surrogate endpoints as opposed to clinical endpoints, which would be overall survival and quality of life uh, for uh, patients with cancer. Um, compared to using those clinical endpoints, using surrogate endpoints will save time and therefore will allow earlier analysis and earlier publication of results. And therefore patients can have access to these treatments earlier than if we had uh, mandated uh, overall survival endpoint. However, that saving of time is, uh, people always argue about, it's a substantial difference in time when you use surrogate endpoints versus clinical endpoint, but that saving of time did not seem to be as big as we were previously thinking it to be. Um, in this paper in 2019, published in JAMA Internal Medicine, 
uh, just showed that compared to using overall survival as the primary endpoint using response rate, shortened study duration by a mean of 19 months and using progression free survival, shortened the study duration by a mean of 11 months. Now, a time shortening of 19 months or 11 months is not nothing. This is, a, this is an important time saving, but it's not like two years or five years of uh, time difference that we uh, frequently think um, is the difference when we are using overall survival as opposed to surrogate endpoints. It is just 19 and 11 months, which is not nothing, but it's not as big as some people think it to be. Uh, but this should be balanced uh, with the uh, with the concept that by using surrogate endpoints, we are actually not getting the actual data on whether the drug will ultimately lead to improvement in patient's quality or uh, duration of life. Um, to quote one example, in the Bolero trial, this is a trial of Everolimus plus eczemestin in breast cancer. So the PFS data were reported in 2012 in New England Journal of Medicine, and it got FD approval, full approval based on this PFS data alone because people thought, oh, we can't wait for OAS, it will take time. But soon in 2014, overall survival data were also reported and overall survival was not significant. This drug did not improve overall survival, but because we thought we can't wait for overall survival, uh, we gave full approval and not even accelerated approval to this drug in 2012 on the basis of PFS itself. So yeah, not all shortcuts work. We love surrogate endpoints. Uh, it is good to use surrogate endpoints because it saves time, but if it does not tell anything about the clinical benefit, then that's not actually helpful. And it can in fact be harmful because we relied on a shortcut that actually didn't work. So what makes a good surrogate endpoint? That's a very important question. And of course, uh, and again, this is from the FDA itself that clinical trials need to show that the surrogate endpoints can be relied upon to predict or correlate with clinical benefit. And here clinical benefit means overall survival and or, or quality of life. And those surrogate endpoints that have undergone this testing are called validated surrogate endpoints and are accepted by the regulators as evidence of benefit. But how many surrogate endpoints have actually been validated then? Uh, there was this uh, systematic review of uh, correlation analysis that were done to validate surrogate endpoints across oncology. And this blue signifies low validation, low correlation. Um, orange signifies medium. And we can see from this chart that in most tumor types, in most settings, the validation is low. Um, and only in a few cases, the validation of surrogate endpoint with overall survival is high. So when we talk about this uh, lack of correlation, some people appropriately argue that overall survival doesn't is not the only endpoint that matters. What if the surrogate endpoints correlates well with quality of life? Because uh, the commonly used uh, surrogate endpoint in metastatic setting like progression for survival, people make an argument that if the disease progression is delayed, doesn't it automatically lead to improvement in quality of life? And isn't that meaningful? Of course, improving quality of life is meaningful, but we cannot just assume that delaying progression will automatically lead to improved quality of life, which might sound counterintuitive, but it's because how we define progression is quite arbitrary in clinical trials. And therefore, we actually wanted to look into this question, does improving PFS actually lead to improved quality of life? And we published this paper in 2018, um, where we looked at 352 uh, phase three randomized trials. And we found that 50% of them, they did not even include quality of life as an endpoint. Of those that included quality of life as an endpoint, a quarter did not report on it. I can guess why they would not want to report quality of life that they have already uh, included. And of those uh, trials where we had data on both PFS and quality of life, when we ran the analysis, the, the correlation was pretty weak. Um, so yes, the bottom line is improving PFS does not automatically mean that it improves quality of life. So we have to specifically measure quality of life and analyze it separately. We can't just guess it based on improved PFS. And the FDA actually has a table, has recently created a table of surrogate endpoints that they think are valid for using in clinical trials that they had previously um, supported approval on the basis of those endpoints or will support approval in the future. So the table looks something like this, uh, just to give a picture. Um, 
and they include these several uh, surrogate endpoints and they say that they can be used for accelerator approval or traditional approval and so on. So I wanted to take a look at how valid the data are for including these surrogate endpoints in the FDA's table. So I took a sample of breast cancer and I wanted to look at all the surrogate endpoints that have been included for breast cancer in the FDA's in the, in the FDA table. And this is uh, the paper that uh, led to um, that came from that project. And this is what we found. What we found was pathological complete response included in the FDA table. It does not have any correlation with the OAS. Disease-free survival does not have correlation, but only in HOT2 positive subgroup, there is a strong correlation. But the FDA table does not separate between any subgroups. It just says breast cancer. Response rate, again, not correlated with OAS. PFS, mild to moderate correlation, but not sufficient enough. Uh, and in fact, this event-free survival has had no data. As you can see in the FDA table, there is event-free survival here, and it says this can be used for accelerated or traditional approval for patients with breast cancer and neuroblastoma. So naturally, you would think that there is some data to support using EFS in breast cancer, but we found that there was no data at all. So actually, we did that analysis ourselves. So this was our second uh, project, a uh, second paper from that project, because we found that nobody had studied EFS before. Uh, we studied it ourselves for breast cancer and we found only moderate correlation. So the problem here that we saw was the FDA was making this table and including several surrogate endpoints for several tumor types. Yeah. And the FDA itself says that the surrogate has to be validated, but in many cases, there was lack of validation. And in one case, like event-free survival, there was no validation study to, to support or even refute the claim that it's a good surrogate endpoint. Okay, uh, moving on from surrogate endpoint to the issue of statistical significance versus clinical meaning. Uh, something might be statistically significant, but might be clinically meaningless. And that's where uh, there, is a, there is an opportunity for, for evidence-based medicine to be hijacked, as I'll show from a couple of examples. These are two breast cancer approvals from last year alone. One is a drop called neratinib, the other is a drop called mazetuximab, both for hot to positive breast cancer. Received full FDA approval, not even accelerated, but complete approval. So these must be some good drugs. These must be changing the life of our patients with hot to positive breast cancer, is what we would naturally think. However, if we look here into the data, and, and of course, there was a lot of news and, and about these two drug approvals. People were celebrating it on Twitter, saying the future is bright. We have exciting two drugs now for how to positive breast cancer. But if we look at data, this is the data for Mazetuximab. This is from the FDA's website itself. This is why the FDA approved it. The difference in median progression of survival, 5.8 months versus 4.9 months. This is not even one month. This is 0 0.9 months of PFS, this is not overall survival. So the first issue was we are using surrogate endpoints instead of overall survival or quality of life. And the second issue is even that surrogate endpoint, the, ma the margin of benefit is so small, even for the surrogate. This is just 0 0.9 months. But yes, it is statistically significant. The PVL is less than 0 0.05, but does it make any sense for our patients? The other drug, neratinib. Overall survival, no difference. There was no difference in overall survival. The p-value was 0 0.2, has a ratio of 0 0.88, but the confidence interval is spans one. But yes, there was a difference in PFS, which led to its approval. And the difference in median PFS was 0 0.1 month, 0 0.1. This is literally three days of difference, which is less than the difference in between, you know, sometimes CT scans. We, order CT scans one week ahead, we, one week later. These trials were just power to detect even a three-day difference in median PFS. Of course, it is significant. You, if you look at the p-value, it's 0 0.0059. The question is, why did just three days difference in median PFS turn out to be statistically significant? Because we overpowered the trial. And of course, OS is not different, but these are the data that lead to regular approval of cancer drugs from the from the regulators 
And that's why we can't be confident about the drugs that have received approval. Are they actually beneficial or they are in fact harmful because the side effects are substantial and the benefit is such a small. Uh, about these two drugs, uh, we had published a paper in, in Nature Reviews uh, uh, earlier this year, uh, where we discussed these particular approvals in, in detail. The third issue that uh, I want to talk about is about service standard control arm. So we talked about using surrogate endpoints. We talked that even the benefit of the margin of benefit in surrogate endpoints is so small, but it is still statistically significant. Now, the third way how our cities can be hijacked is by using a control arm that uh, nobody would actually use in real life. So not that the new drug is better, but that the control arm is worse. So how can that happen? How can uh, the, the control arm be substandard? It can happen in two ways. One is using a treatment in the control arm that we already know is inferior to another treatment, a, a treatment that has already failed in previous trials or has been beaten in previous trials. And the second is using a placebo when the default treatment, the standard of care is actually using active treatment. So I'll give an example of each. Uh, so let's talk about uh, using a control treatment already known to be inferior to another treatment. So for patients with non-small cell lung cancer, the treatment paradigm changed in 2016 uh, when data showed that using pembrolizumab as monotherapy significantly, remarkably improved overall survival versus using chemotherapy, especially if the PDL1 was uh, positive, especially if it was more than 50%. This was, this was a really good trial and the, the magnitude of uh, benefit for patients with PDL1 was more than 50% was really remarkable. Um, and this drug got USFD approval in October 2016. Uh, as you can see the dates here, it was first announced in June of 2016. You, uh, FDA approved it in October 2016. The full paper was published in New England Journal in November 2016. So since mm, these uh, were known uh, to the physicians, Pembrolizumab became the default standard of care for any patients with non cell lung cancer, uh, whose PDL one uh, was more than 50%. Um, and that's what the normal practice looked like. However, there was another trial of semiplimab against chemotherapy in exactly the same patient population, PDL one of more than 50%, at least 50%, and semiplimab versus again, chemotherapy. And this trial was run from 2017, June 2017 to February 2020. Like in 2020, even in 2017, but especially in 2019, 2020, no patient in the world would be prescribed chemotherapy if, if they had an option to get pembrolizumab or immunotherapy. But this trial intentionally randomized patients to semiplimab, which is a newer Me2 uh, version of uh, uh, pembrolizumab versus chemotherapy, which is uh, which was already shown to be inferior to immunotherapy in the previous trial that I just showed. And, and one can question the, like we should question the ethics of running such a trial, but the, but the trial sponsors and funders argued that Oh, we ran this trial outside of US and Canada in other parts of the world. Uh, but the problem is they use this data to get it approved in the US FDA. Where they ran this trial, I'm pretty confident that most of the patients will not have access to this drug, but they use this trial that was ran entirely outside of USA against a control arm that is unethical would never have been possible to do this trial in USA, but got the drug approved by the US FDA. So this is an issue of global health research, uh, which is not uh, a topic of talk today, but which is something that I'm very passionate about. And we can talk about these issues on global health research on some other day, but today I'm just citing this example to give, an, uh, to give a sense of how trials are being done using inferior control arm to get uh, regulatory approval. 
the other example of substandard control arm, as I mentioned, was using a placebo where active treatment is the default. Now, an example comes from the trial of olaparib in pancreatic cancer. When this uh, trial results were announced, experts were saying olaparib should become the new standard of care, not could or may, but it should become. Someone said these results are truly remarkable. Another expert said that this is really exciting data. And one person said that it is our duty to search for this mutation and, and treat it with olaparib. And that means if you are not doing this, um, you are you are going away from your duty as a physician, as an oncologist. So that, that means that this must be truly remarkable drug. It must improve survival and quality of life by many bounds. If not using this drug means failing our duty, then this should be a highly remarkable drug. But actually, this is the data. So this is the trial that led the experts to make such comments. And in so these are patients with pancreatic cancer, a highly lethal disease. And chemotherapy is the standard of care for them in first line. And usually in our practice, what we do is we keep them on chemotherapy for as long as they respond and, can, and, and do not have unbearable toxicities. But even if there are some toxicities, from the combination chemotherapy. This is a combination of three different chemo. So we would take one chemo away or two chemo away and put the patient on, the, on at least one chemo if the tumor is responding. But here on the trial, what they did was they selected patients who were responding to chemo, but after 16 weeks in chemotherapy, they stopped their chemo and then randomized them to receive olaparib or placebo. In real life, nobody would get placebo. Like if they were responding at 16 weeks, would you still keep them on chemotherapy until they progress? But here the control arm patients were harmed because they did not have the opportunity to continue on the chemo that they were responding on and they were randomized to placebo. Even then, even then, the drug improved PFS, as you can see in the graph, but there was absolutely no improvement in OS. Even when the control arm patients started to get placebo instead of chemo. So what about quality of life then? Did it improve quality of life? The quality of life was reported as the quality of life was maintained. And what does quality of life maintained mean? It is a fancy way of saying quality of life was not improved. So basically, this is a drug that does not improve how a patient feels or how long the patient lives, but it costs more than $12,000 a month and has significant side effects. And these are the drugs that the experts say is our duty to use the data are really exciting. It's truly remarkable and it should become a new standard of care. So this is what, I'm, what I mean by saying EBM is being hijacked. People are using the tools of the EBM like randomization, but using it to prove that a drug that actually could be harmful is a good drug and it is our duty to use that drug. The other way in which EBM can be hijacked or, or RCTs can be hijacked is using inappropriate crossover and post-progression therapies. So when I say inappropriate crossover, there are, there are two types. One is crossover should have happened, but did not happen. For example, in patients with prostate cancer, abiraterone was the standard of care based on a previous trial for castration-resistant prostate cancer. In this trial that I'm showing here, they wanted to test abiratron earlier in an earlier line of therapy while the patient is still hormone sensitive and the control arm is placebo. So what happens in real world is once these patients on placebo here, if they progress, uh, that means if they become castration-resistant, they get abiratron. That is already a standard of care, first line treatment there. But here we can see that these placebo arm patients, when they progressed, it's given in the supplementary table, it shows that only 11% of the patients in the placebo arm, they got Ebratron as a subsequent line of therapy. And of course, there is an overall survival difference here, but we don't know whether this overall survival difference is because these placebo arm patients did not get Ebratron when they progressed. So, we, this trial was supposed to answer the question whether we should use Ebratron here while the patient is still hormone sensitive or when the patient becomes hormone resistant. But that question has not been answered because only 11% of the patients in the placebo arm actually got the drug when 
they progressed. So this trial should have incorporated crossover design, but it did not. So, but the, the example of the other way around where crossover should not have happened, but happened also comes from prostate cancer. So this is a drug called Cipilicil T, uh, uh, an immunotherapy. Uh, so this is the trial of Cipilicil T versus placebo for castration resistant prostate cancer. And this trial incorporated crossover. So all the patients in the placebo arm, when they progressed, they were supposed to receive Cipilicil T. However, this Cipilicil T had never been proven in prostate cancer. It had no data before, but docetaxel was the standard of care because it improved survival. It was a standard of, um, it was the default treatment. So what happened here was because of the crossover design, patients, sorry, this should have been 2004 instead of 2014. Uh, so what happened here was because the patients crossover to receive Cipilicil T, actually they, there was delay in receiving docetaxel because they had to be crossover to receive Cipilicil T and then uh, spend some time getting Cipilicil T before they actually got the treatment that was already proven. So rather than Cipilicil T benefiting the patients, I think it was the delay in receiving docetaxel that led to a difference in outcomes in this trial. Therefore, you can see that, yes, there was a difference in overall survival. However, there was no difference in progression for survival or, or time to disease progression. And in fact, there was only one response, like not one person, but just one, one patient who had a partial response. So a drug that cannot produce any response at all, does not improve time to tumor progression. How does it improve only overall survival? because most likely the, the patients in the control arm, they did much worse because they could not receive docetaxel in time. The other, a newer variety uh, of a, a newer tool in the arsenal to hijack EBM is the non-inferiority design trials. Uh, we first wrote this paper about uh, approving cancer drugs based on non-inferiority trial designs um, after seeing the lembartinib non-inferiority design trial in liver cancer. But after that, we tried to, uh, we wanted to take a deeper dive and, and do a systematic review of uh, all the randomized non-inferiority clinical trials in, of cancer drugs in oncology. And in this research, we found that uh, non-infinite design was not justified in 40% of the trials and industry funding was associated with lack of justification. Now, what do I mean by justification? Non-infinite trials are not inherently bad. There are some occasions where non-infinite trials make sense. And that is when we call justified non-infinite design trials. So the justifications could be that the newer drug is less expensive than the standard of care, which almost never happens. But if it is less expensive, then you could possibly do a non-infinity design trial, um, which is actually true in case of biosimilars. Um, the other is if the newer newer drug uh, provides some added advantage, for example, the standard of care is intravenous treatment, but the newer drug is oral. So some patients might be willing to accept some threshold of non-infinity for that convenience of having an oral drug versus intravenous drug or let's say the standard of care is weekly chemo, the newer drug is once every three weeks. So in such cases of uh, with low cost, increased convenience, uh, or improved quality of life, then non infinite design might be justified. But we found that in 40% of the trials, there was absolutely no justification. The newer drug was not improving quality of life. The newer drug was not oral versus intravenous. Uh, the newer drug was not cheaper. Uh, but still the non infinite design was being used and that had significant association with who was funding the trial. And this is what we found. We found that the non infinity criteria, how we define non infinity was quite different across the trials. And actually there was no, usually there was no explanation given as to why that non infinity cry, that non infinity criteria was chosen. And here we found that up, we saw a non infinity criteria or the non infinity definition of up to 1.33, uh, which means 
the upper limit of the 95% confidence interval of the hazard ratio for survival up to 1.33 would be considered non-inferior. What that actually means in very simplified terms is up to a 33% increase in the hazard of mortality was considered acceptable or non-inferior. Again, we did not ask the patients up to what percentage increase in the risk of dying was acceptable to them. Uh, uh, we just came up with these arbitrary numbers. We just said, okay, 33% increase in the risk of dying is, is okay. Um, but there was not even justification for using the non inferior design in, in many of these uh, trials. I'll give one specific example, and this is, this was published after our research was done. So this particular example is not included in our um, research table, but this is a very uh, egregious example. I have I had never seen a non infinity margin like this in my life. So this is a trial of pazopinib, a newer targeted drug versus doxorubicin, a classic old chemo for patients with sarcoma. It was mind blowing to me to read that the non infected definition here was not even for OS, it was for progression free survival, and it was 1.8. 1.8. That means almost twice the, the hazard of progressing was considered non inferior. Like, I don't know any patient would accept this limit as non inferior. And this was the results. They found that the PFS hazard ratio was one. The confidence interval went up to 1.53. That means there is up to 50% higher hazard of uh, the PFS being worse. But by this definition, it is non-inferior because this 1.5 is less than 1.8. And they conclude that it is non-inferior and, and it is one of the options that you can use. The other is running unjustified trials to begin with. Uh, I, I tried to analyze why some of the oncology trials, they, they fail at phase three stage of development. And uh, we published uh, that work in this paper in JAMA Open. And we found that we looked at a cohort of negative phase three RCTs. And we found that more than 40% of those negative phase three RCTs were conducted without a supporting phase two. And in fact, the surprising thing was up to 14% of these trials were conducted despite a negative phase two, despite a negative phase two. So the phase two was negative, but they still went on to do a phase three. Now, why does that happen? Why would you want to run the risk of doing a phase three when the phase two is already negative? I think that's because the profit margins are so high that it may be profitable to even run a number of phase threes that have a high likelihood of being negative just in the in the faint hope of getting one of those trials where the p-value is less than 0.05 uh, so that you can recoup all the all the investment costs. The other is the issue of subgroup analysis. This is a very high profile example from very recent years, Impassion 130 trial of atezolizumab in triple negative advanced breast cancer. As you can see, the, clearly that it is mentioned that the try, in the trial methods that there would be a hierarchical testing design for overall survival. That means they would first test overall survival in the intention to treat population. And if that is positive, then they would check the PDL1 positive subgroup population. But this is what happened. The intention to treat population overall survival was not positive. The p-value was 0 0.08. So this was negative. Based on the trial's own protocol, if the intention to treat population was negative, then they can't cannot test the PDL1 positive subgroup. They can test the subgroup only if the ITT is positive. ITT is negative, but they still wanted to rescue the trial. So against their own statistical plan, in violation of their own statistical plan, they did indeed conduct OS analysis in the PDL1 positive subgroup as well. And here they could show that, oh, it, there was a difference and it was significant. They could not claim significance, uh, but yes, there is a big difference here. And they, and they claim that for PDL1 positive subgroup, this is a very beneficial drug, improving overall survival, substantially 36 months versus 53 months and got EFT approval as well as an accelerator approval. 
So because it was an accelerated approval, they were supposed to conduct a confirmatory trial, which they did in Passion 131. They haven't published it yet, but they presented the results at uh, last year's ASMO. And in Passion 131, unsurprisingly for me, it failed because this PDL1 positive subgroup analysis was in violation of their own statistical plan. Uh, the confirmatory trial showed that actually atezolizumab did not improve overall survival, even in PDL1 positive subgroup or intention to treat population. And even PFS failed here. But some people still argue that when, when Impassion 131 results were published, uh, some people still continue to argue that atezolizumab is beneficial based on this analysis that was conducted in violation of the of the statistical plan and they started coming up with reasons why impasse 131 was negative rather than why this was a false positive so we have recently published about uh, this um, controversy in jama oncology about atezolizumab in in triple negative breast cancer but this um, this trick of running subgroup analysis post hoc or in violation of the statistical plan and claiming difference based on subgroup analysis when the overall um, trial fails. Um, this is not infrequent in oncology. Uh, we talked about how RCTs can be hijacked. The other um, point was about how we are trying to get rid of RCTs altogether. And that is by supporting more and more single arm trials uh, based uh, approvals and using real world evidence. We, we did this uh, research in 2019 where we looked at response rates and duration of response for the targeted drugs in randomized trials versus single arm trials. Same drug, same disease setting, uh, response rate and duration of response in RCTs versus single arm trials. And we found that the responses, uh, the response rates were usually smaller in RCTs than in single arm trials in 63% of the cases. In, in case of duration of response, actually, it was larger in single arm trials in 87% of the cases. So basically, if you are doing single arm trial, you usually get higher response rate and duration of response than when you test the same drug in the same population in a randomized fashion. And for example, this, uh, this is for the duration of response. We can see that the duration of response was significantly higher um, in non-randomized trials, in single arm trials, 17% higher in single arm trials compared to the same drug, same disease, in a randomized trial. But we see that more and more drugs are being approved by the FDA based on response rate and duration of response in single arm trials. The concern is that those responses are falsely elevated. Uh, and the other thing is that they do not correlate with overall survival. And the other argument nowadays people are making is using real world evidence uh, uh, to support drug approvals. Of course, RCTs they are the gold standard to prove efficacy. But uh, people argue that RCTs are not representative of real world patients. They are expensive to conduct. They are arduous, time consuming, resource consuming, which are all true. But the solution to, uh, but these are the problems of RCTs that can be solved. The solution to a bad RCT is not no RCT. The solution to a bad RCT is a good RCT. Uh, poor participation and lack of representation of real world patients is, is not the fault of RCT design, it is our fault which we have to fix. In this paper, we discuss in detail about uh, RW, real world evidence and RCTs and where they can be helpful, but the bottom line is real world evidence is not helpful to support drug approval. RCTs must be needed to support drug approval. Real world evidence is just a fancy way of saying observational studies. These are just observational data. Um, they can help us uh, to guide our clinical practice in several ways, but they are they cannot help us to support drug approval. For example, in this paper, um, we looked at how checkpoint inhibitors were being used in urothelial cancer towards the end of life. What we showed here was after checkpoint inhibitors uh, were approved by the FDA, patients with even poor performance status who would not have received any treatment in the very last 60 days of their life, even those patients were now getting immunotherapy because of that immunotherapy optimism bias. So yes, real world evidence are, are useful to, to give us such type of information, but no, they are not useful to tell us which drug should be approved and which drug should not be approved. And in fact, uh, if we can learn any lesson from COVID uh, for oncology is that an RCT in 
an RCT conducted properly in time saves much, much more lives than hundreds of those so-called real world evidence uh, studies. We, we have seen that aspirin, azithromycin, hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, these all those litany of drugs that were purported to be helpful in, in, in COVID-19 based on all those so-called real world evidences have been refuted by conducting proper randomized trials. Um, so if we don't do randomized trials, we'll be using such type of harmful and useless drugs in patients with cancer as well. So the final point was about flaws in trial reporting. I'll give you an example. So this trial, uh, the conclusion of this trial publication uh, read that this new drug, nanoliposimal irinotecan in pancreatic cancer, had a side effect that was manageable and mostly reversible. Manageable and mostly reversible safety profile. This is just a just a just an example. Most of the clinical trial reports report safety in such a way. They say side effects are tolerable, well tolerated, acceptable. But if you look into this trial, fatal adverse event was five versus zero. Fatal, like patients died from toxicities. Five patients in the drug arm versus zero in the control arm died. How can we say that this is manageable and even reversible? How do you reverse death? And if someone died from toxicities, how can we say that the side effects were manageable? So this is how we uh, sugarcoat the toxicities. Uh, and in fact, uh, in this 2018 BMZ paper, we looked at uh, most of these trials that were, that were using such downplaying terms to describe harms like acceptable, manageable, feasible, favorable toxicity profile, well tolerated, safe, and what we found was, in fact, those trials that use such terms to downplay toxicities had a higher percentage of um, severe, serious, and fatal adverse events in the experimental arm uh, than the control arm. So it it was it was a misnomer. It was almost as if 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 a trial said the toxicity was tolerable, it was not. And the second issue about trial reporting uh, concerns. Um, Conflicts of interest issues. Uh, again, an example. This was a um, paper published in Lancet Oncology about a new drug called enamorelin for patients with uh, cancer and cachexia. So patients with cancer, they get wasted, they lose their muscle mass, and they become very weak. So this was a new drug uh, that they tested if it can help with that. And the conclusion was, considering the unmet medical need for safe and effective treatments for cachexia, enamorelin might be a treatment option for these patients. And I was excited to read this because so far we did not have any medication for cancer cachexia. So this might, this looked like this would be a brand new treatment option for these patients. But when I read the results, I found that this drug actually increased muscle mass by less than one kilogram, less than one kilogram without improving muscle function. So that means the patient would still not be able to button his shorts. She would still not be able to open the door handle. But yes, her muscle mass increased by 600, 700 grams. What sense does it make? It makes absolutely no sense to me. And of course, this trial was funded by the pharmaceutical company which made the drug. Up until now, nothing unusual. The role of the funding source Yes, the funder was involved in study design, did everything basically, uh, even wrote the report, as you can see here. It not only designed, but it also interpreted the trial results and was involved in writing of the report. This is very odd that the writing was also done by the industry. But more importantly, I was, more, I was interested in reading the editorial about this trial. There was this editorial and the editorial was super positive. The editorial said, in conclusion, these trials offer new hopes for more effective therapeutic strategies. And I was like, how can anyone write an editorial saying this is a wonderful drug? So I looked up the conflict of interest and I found that the editorialist had received fees from blah, 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 and Helsin, the same exact company, and an advisory board member fee from Helsin, exactly same company that manufactured this drug. I was shocked. Like I would not expect. Like I would. I would hope that the editorial list are free from conflicts of interest at all. 
but i would at least expect them not to have conflict of interest from the exact same company for the exact same drug that is being discussed so uh, we published we did this research and it was published actually less than a month ago i think where we looked at the editorial list in these top journals with uh, industry related conflict of interest and we we um, saw if they wrote unduly favorable editorials for cancer drugs and we found that having any financial conflict of interest for example you know um, the drug being discussed is produced by pfizer but the editorial list is receiving money from mark then there was no correlation but direct financial conflict of interest drug being discussed is produced by pfizer the editorial list is also receiving money from pfizer in those cases of direct financial conflict of interest there was a significant association between having those conflicts and writing an unduly favorable editorial and and this is not like uh, a sting operation or anything this is disclosed financial conflict of interest that was disclosed in the paper itself so the editorialists were not lying they were saying that yes i have received money from pfizer but still the journals were asking them to write an editorial editorial about a cancer drug that was produced from the same exact company so we discuss all these problems uh, and how evm is being hijacked so what can we do about it i think the most important point of intervention would be to improve statistical literacy and common sense uh, among physicians patients stakeholders everyone there has been a big issue with the lack of uh, proper communication uh, between the trialists physicians stakeholders patients um, so this uh, lack of communication and this uh, issue of not understanding uh, these flaws uh, that should be the first point of intervention uh, just to quote an example one of my colleagues um, was pretty excited about this trial when this was first published in jco so i i tried to look a little more into detail and when i'm saying i'm one of my colleagues this is an oncologist colleague so i'm trying to say how even us professionals we get fooled by the way that the, the trials are reported and the conclusion said the study met its primary endpoint and the last sentence you can see regraph and it should be considered a treatment option for patients with uh, osteosarcoma if you read only the conclusion then of course you would think that you should use this drug from tomorrow but if you look into the data then it says the pfs was 3.6 versus 1.7 months okay not a good margin of benefit but until now nothing very very fishy versus other trials and then it says in the context of crossover design it gives a justification and says there was no statistically significant difference in os okay os did not improve only pfs improved a typical cancer drug just like others but then you see that actually os was shorter with the drug than with the placebo the placebo arm patients were living longer than patients who were getting the drug yes it was not statistically significant but the hazard ratio is 1.26 it goes up to 3.13 this is a potentially very very harmful drug and then when they reported adverse events they reported that there was one grade 3 pneumothorax and one grade 4 colonic perforation usually people report these adverse events in terms of percentages but here they were reporting numbers one grade 3 pneumothorax and one grade 4 colonic perforation unsurprisingly in this trial they they prefer to use numbers instead of percentages because the sample size was low so even one patient meant 5% in this case so one grade 3 pneumothorax means 5% of our patients will have grade 3 pneumothorax so these are like some small small tweaks that people use while writing the paper and things like that 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 can get even professionals confused and that can masquerade the um, the harms from the drug if we see for example any drug that says has a ratio of 0 0.99 95 percent confidence interval goes up to 1.3 p value of 0 0.95 our impression would be that okay this is a failed trial we should not be using this drug but again another example here you can see that this was about the TVO3 trial and here 
it says that this results, and in this case, they say include an OS hazard ratio below one, favoring the drop. So even such type of blatant uh, failed data can be spun to give a favorable impression about the drop. So, you know, that's like claiming success, even when it's obvious that uh, there is no success. Uh, so in summary, um, I think evidence-based medicine was founded to ensure right care to right patients, but it is now being hijacked to promote marginal and, and toxic therapies to patients. And low value care is being promoted by misusing these tools. And at least awareness of, this, of these issues from all relevant stakeholders is important to preserve the integrity of ABM and to protect our patients from other vested interests. Uh, just revisiting this slide that I showed earlier on about EBM pyramid, I think this should be replaced with a different sort of pyramid that one of my friends on Twitter put it so succinctly. I think this should be our evidence-based uh, medicine pyramid. We should be very thoughtful about uh, how the study was conducted, what are the flaws in the studies. Just simply because it's a RCT does not mean it's a good evidence. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm happy to discuss uh, further about any of these topics that we have uh, that I have talked today. Thanks. Thank you so much, Bishal. Uh, if you could close the slide so we can see everyone. All right. Great. So uh, fortunately, Bishal can stay extra 15 minutes. I realize that some of you might have to go, but uh, if you can stay, please turn on your cameras and uh, let's start with the discussion. So who wants to go first? You can raise your hand through Zoom or just they can see you waving on the screen. But Ab, go ahead. Um, thank you very much, Elizabeth. So Bishal, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, thank you. It's a bunch of information that is very new to me. And I work uh, in the University of Helsinki. I'm a PhD student. I work in the translation of the department. Bulat, so, uh, we cannot hear you very well. If you can speak into the microphone, it will be great. Sorry, I'm using a new microphone. So what I wanted to ask, actually, um, you showed quite a few, well, to my mind, absolutely horrifying graphs with pieces of information. Now, in a lot of survival curves, in a lot of slides, survival curves do not show any kind of confidence intervals. So you would often get uh, seemingly different survival curves and seemingly benefit from a particular treatment. But then when we take into account, into account the confidence intervals, they do cross. And then those benefits are no longer statistics. So I was wondering, uh, could you maybe comment on that part? Uh, yeah, that's uh, interesting. Uh, they do report on confidence intervals of the um, survival of the experimental in the control arm, but uh, I totally see your point. If we could plot the confidence interval in the survival curves itself, then people would be, uh, it would be easier for people to understand that the possibility of differences were, was slimmer than what we would see by uh, plotting only the median survival uh, in the graph. Yeah, I think I think that's a very good idea. Um, I would I would support that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Who wants to go next? Go, Grace, go ahead. I just had a quick question. So your your um, talk was fairly provocatively titled um, "Hijacking." You know who hijacked. Uh, evidence. Do you think it's sort of deliberate or do you think it's sort of attenuation over time and lack of focus? I mean, do you think that there's a deliberate attempt to pervert the court of justice, so to speak? Um, yeah, I agree that my, my title was uh, uh, provocative. Uh, but I think uh, this hijacking of uh, EBM has happened slowly but consistently over over past many years. Uh, 
and the the reason why I use the term hijacking was instead of saying the evidence-based medicine is faulty, or instead of attacking ABM, people use the tools of the ABM and twisted it. And like previously, you would say, "Oh, this is not randomized trial," but now people are bringing you randomized trials and showing you the evidence from randomized trials. But clearly, if you go into the depth, then the trial is faulty. They are using inappropriate control arms and and so many other issues. Uh, so in that sense, uh, instead of throwing away EBM, uh, EBM was hijacked uh, to serve a different purpose than why EBM was first uh, introduced. Um, but about whether the attack uh, or the hijacking has been delivered, uh, uh, I, I don't know. But uh, I think one of the uh, one of the problems is also that uh, most of us do not speak about it. We see those attacks, uh, but in a way we are, I guess, complacent or we are um, a part of the, of, the, of the process itself um, or because uh, people in, in the position of authority, they support these uh, attacks. Um, it's, it's difficult for new people, for upcoming people, junior people um, to to say anything against it because you do not want to be um, an outsider of the system. Uh, so I think uh, if everybody would uh, be aware of these issues and if everybody would start speaking about these issues, then I think uh, we could turn the tide. But uh, as like so far as I can see, uh, we are not going to turn the tide anytime soon. Michelle, um, you've shown two examples of good trials, solidarity and recovery, completely on the same page with you, really great success during the COVID era. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think all trials who that are hijacked, so to speak, are coming from the industry. These are big phase three approval trials. Uh, but we also know that academia is not without its faults as well. And there are a lot of pretty bad academic trials. It's just these are not registrational trials often, well, they're not registrational trials by design. So um, do you know if anyone has done work looking into hijacked uh, academic trials? Uh, I'm not aware of any such work uh, myself, but uh, with my colleagues from Anti-Cancer Fund, we did look at uh, uh, the interventions in lung cancer that had led to improved survival for our patients with lung cancer. And we tried to look at, uh, we tried to look at what trials led to survival benefit and who was sponsoring and funding those trials. Um, it may not, uh, it is not exactly the answer that you're looking for, but uh, what we found was academic trials had a major role um, to uh, like ac academia sponsored trials were the trials that showed us um, significant improvement in survival. And these were the trials of usually surgery and radiation instead of, instead of drug trials. Uh, so that highlights the importance of continued funding for academia sponsored, like publicly funded trials, because without those public funding, we would not have trials like recovery as well. But uh, even in cancer, we would not have had trials um, that sort of benefit of surgery or radiation or, or palliative care. Any other questions, Lisa? Oh, hello, Michelle. Fantastic Hi, talk. I've, I've enjoyed that. Um, and actually, for a conference that um, myself and John Hickman organised back in March 2019, where Vinay Prasad did a brilliant talk, it, it, it certainly touched on quite a lot of the things you discussed. Really, we're talking man-made barriers here. We're not talking about cancer. We're talking about how we design clinical evidence, inverted commas, in order to approve drugs and or to use it in the sort of clinic or in clinical practice. I think I've got lots of comments to make. One is let's not forget the risks and the you know, time that is undertaken, not only by the clinical trial organizers and administrators, but of the patients involved. It's particularly disturbing to me that not only have we got inappropriate control arms or lack of control arms crossover going on that shouldn't be going on or vice versa. But then the audacity to have 
fake blatant lies, frankly, that are published in the abstracts of articles when you actually dig into the main text. Um, this type of behavior, um, you, you very bravely try to call it out, um, but it feels a little bit, doesn't it, like it's falling on deaf ears. I just wanted to get your opinion on whether you think part of this is still an education and raising an awareness issue. Um, you know, not everyone in the field of oncology is reading your good work and your papers. So is there any sort of outrage on social media as well as within the sort of literature, peer reviewed literature community about this? And, and a step further to this is the ne next part of the question is, what grassroots movements can we undertake to stop this completely sort of nefarious practice going on? And I think it's been happening actually for decades. The literature has been littered with little clever buzzwords, new little nuances, gradually over the years to the point where people have become sort of almost uh, brainwashed, you might say, or accepting of lower. The bar is so low, you can actually physically step over it. There is no bar in a lot of cases. But of course, there are some good trials out there, so we don't want to do a disservice to those. But when you get the trials coming along along the nature that you've described, it's it's just pretty, it, you know, you, you want to almost bury your head in a, in a sort of box of tissues and cry your heart out. But the sheer nonsense that's occurring, especially editorialists with direct financial conflict of interest associated with the co companies that are actually doing these trials, why on earth the editors of the journals are not looking at this carefully and saying you cannot write an editorial on this because you are conflicted is be it, it baffles me so i'll be interested in your thoughts thank you lisa uh, obviously uh, there are no easy solutions i guess but uh, and i do feel uh, sometimes that uh, i do question myself sometimes whether what i'm doing is making a difference uh, but i guess what uh, what keeps me going is not uh, the like i'm not i guess i'm not planning to change the senior academics who would not who already have uh, been practicing or uh, doing things in their own way but what keeps me going is the newer generation of doctors and oncologists who are more and more aware of these issues I meet with a number of them uh, during conferences and like uh, I get emails from them. I, I, I work with uh, many of them, but this newer generation of oncologists who are not afraid to think outside the box. And I think social media is helping a lot with that uh, because through social media, you can actually uh, see real time updates of how people think and how people respond to the same data uh, based on uh, their preferences, their, their conflicts and, and everything. And this uh, this is what keeps me going, uh, seeing the newer generation of oncologists who are unafraid uh, and who are um, who have the integrity to, to question uh, the data and who are uh, who who are ethical. Um, I, I did learn from several of uh, the mentors who walked uh, this path before me. Uh, but what keeps me going is looking at the looking at the newer generation of oncologists and i think through these sort of initiatives if we can increase the awareness because in the newer generation of oncologists it could simply be lack of uh, lack of awareness or lack of education um, sometimes uh, actually you see that even in senior people uh, they are not always aware of these deeper issues because as a clinician you are trained to treat patients and not necessarily examine the data um, so if someone is paid not to look at things, then they will not look at things. But if someone is not paid, and someone was just uh, someone just didn't know how to look, then I think that's where it makes a difference. Um, and that's why uh, uh, that's why I, I I guess I do what I do in order to uh, increase the awareness of these issues and and at least to reach out to the younger generation of uh, doctors and oncologists who would. Uh, who would carry the thoughts on and at least uh, form a critical mass where uh, our voices together could make a difference rather than we speaking in silos in, in individual places. And I think social media does help to break our silos and um, try to uh, 
bring those efforts together. I, I think the, the best example for that was when Adora trial results were presented at uh, ASCO meeting last year. That was the trial of osimertinib in uh, adjuvant lung cancer. Uh, remarkable disease-free survival benefit, but no overall survival. And on, on Twitter, you could actually see two different communities being built up. One was, we should be starting this drug yesterday, and the other one was, uh, we need to wait for the overall survival results. Uh, and and uh, of course, like everyone does not have nefarious intentions. Uh, everyone, we should not, uh, we should not start with the premise that everyone who says, well, I'll be using this drug tomorrow is starting from a point of uh, conflict of interest or, or from uh, bad intentions. But what I could see was, uh, and later on, like uh, I and Jack West, we wrote a paper about it and published it in JCO, published it in JAMA Oncology. But after that, uh, I started receiving several emails from oncologists in different corners of the world, like oncologists from Chile, for example, uh, which is a low and middle income country. And they have a special fund from the government, like the government apparently gives them a certain amount of money every year, and they have to use it on their own discretion to cover which cancer drugs and uh, for which patient and so on. And like they were writing to me saying that our paper helped them to make a decision uh, so that they did not prioritize that, that uh, drug over, you know, for example, giving Herceptin to patients with uh, metastatic breast cancer. Uh, so, you know, these, these are the things I think that makes a difference, which may not always be visible to us in front of our eyes, but uh, people across the world, uh, um, whoever wants to uh, actually learn from it or whoever actually wants to understand the process, I think they find it helpful. And uh, in, in a way, we I guess our work will make a difference in places that we don't know. Yeah, that's a really good answer. I mean, one of the just of sort of continuation of the point you just raised is that even if we were having higher awareness among the sort of academic clinical trialist, if you like, research data integration, um, sort of, if you like, population, you've still got to get that filter down into the, in the trenches, doctors who don't look at clinical trials and data, which is still a huge population of, you know, people that are treating um, yeah. cancer patients in the clinic. So we, we still got quite a mountain to climb, I suppose, but it's encouraging that you get um, some fantastic, um, you know, insights and, and, from new people that are coming through who aren't just blindly following things, they are questioning. So I'm, I'm pleased to hear that. Thank you, Bishal. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. We have two more questions before we wrap, wrap up. So one is from John in the chat and another one is from Lydia. So why don't we start with John's question? So Bishal, if you can just read the question from the chat and everyone can just read it so we don't repeat it. And then- Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think uh, John makes, uh, a very important point uh, about informing patient support groups. Um, and to be honest, I personally find uh, it much more fruitful when I'm giving a talk to patient advocacy organizations, uh, because as members of the patient community, I think they should be very much aware of these issues. Uh, and whenever I have given um, this talk to, to, to patient communities, like uh, I gave a talk to uh, patients with colorectal cancer, um, a couple of months ago, and, and I have given talks to patients with uh, um, this br uh, breast cancer patient advocacy organizations for a number of times. And I think uh, when, when patients see what's happening underneath, I think they become very surprised. Uh, most of the patients, as, as I mentioned, even physicians are not aware of these issues. So it's not surprising that most of the patients are not aware of uh, these issues. Uh, like as a clinician myself, I like no patient ever asked me what the magnitude of benefit was, like unless I offer that information to them. No patient ever ever asked me what the confidence interval was or why should they even bother about it, right? Um, so I think informing patient uh, advocacy organizations is quite important. After um, like one of my talks about where I talked about these issues, um, one patient um, advocate actually emailed me about uh, he did a search of the clinical trials at Gob website himself, and he wanted to get an opinion about the control arms in those trials in which he was planning to get enrolled into. Uh, so, uh, yeah, definitely, I think in order to make 
like patients are the most important stakeholders. It's ultimately the patients who are going to use these drugs. Um, so I would absolutely 100% support uh, uh, educating patient advocacy organizations about this. Even in breast cancer, I think in particularly in breast cancer community, we see such good examples. Uh, I was talking about atezolizumab in triple negative breast cancer. When the FDA gave its approval, we saw certain breast cancer advocacy organizations who were very happy with that approval. And we actually saw a couple of breast cancer advocacy organizations like NBCC, who actually said this drug should not be approved. Now, that's something that you don't see often that a patient advocacy organization is saying this drug should not be approved. Uh, but that's, I guess, the result of uh, patients and advocates being more and more aware of the issues that we keep uh, talking about. Thank you, Vishal. So last question from Lydia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bishal. Really great talk. And I, I think it's all our responsibility to spread your word to, to the community. But um, I think especially in Europe, we have to target uh, the HTAs. Because as a patient represent, representative in EMA in the CAT group, I learned that EMA doesn't really care. It's not within their limits, I will say. They uh, to look at added value for patients. They really focus on on safe, on quality and safety and statistics. So they only look at p values, and we it just they say it's not within their limits, and they're right. So the commission has to change that. But now that we will we are evolving towards the European HDA, I think that that that's really what we have to target. And I would love to share your slides with some people I have in mind there. And I really, you're right. Uh, patients can put more and more pressure, but still, uh, especially in the European system, all decisions are taken at the HDA level. And, and I think it's very important if you could present your talk to HDA organizations. That's how I would see it. And then I've put something in the chat uh, about a new uh, initiative, which I think might be very interesting. Uh, it's a nonprofit. It's uh, about the the Good Clinical Trial Collaborative, and they're asking for feedback before September 15th. <laughs> Though I don't want to put pressure on you, but I think it would be really great if you could look at this, those ideas and proposal and, and add your comments to that. That will really, and it's if you look who's behind it, it's both people from EMA, from FDA, it's international. That would be really great if you could give some input there. Gautier will do that also, but your input will be really great, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lady. Uh, yeah, I absolutely. I would be more than happy to talk with uh, any regulatory agencies and, and STAs. And I think, yeah, yeah, the STAs do do care a lot about um, like the cost of the drugs as well. But I guess what I have presented today has nothing to do with cost. No. Like, yeah, even if that, that drug was available for $10 a month, uh, those are still bad trials and they may not be in patients' best interest. No, but uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, Bishal, but now in Europe, I don't know if you follow that, it's just from last month, there will be joint clinical assessment by HDAs, independent of the cost, because the cost will remain uh, something to decide. It's at the member state level, but the joint clinical assessment will be more European. So that's where we have to focus on, I think. And uh, I think this good trials, uh, one of the documents was sent to me by Dr. Joseph Peter here in Queen's University as well. And um, I did read the, the draft PDF version. Uh, my, my, of course, it's a, it's a wonderful initiative. My, my confusion was I didn't know who the targeted audience was. It looked a little too complex for the lay audience and a little too simplistic for um, trialists or, or um, uh, stakeholders. Uh, I think it's really for also for policy work that uh, it's meant. So therefore, yeah, you're right. It has to be in between. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I didn't know who the targeted audience was. Yeah, but um, absolutely, this is a wonderful initiative. Uh, Lydia, actually, excellent question. As the only representative of a former HTA had. Uh, 
I was when Vishal was talking, I was actually thinking to myself, which of these drugs got a yes and which ones of them got a no from NICE and quite a few are on the no list, but you'll be surprised which ones are on the yes list. And I was also thinking if uh, your slides on those trials were presented to the committee in the way they were presented, because I think NICE does a pretty good job looking at the evidence, but I really wonder what kind of decision committee would make and uh, uh, quite a few drugs which were approved, at least at NICE, I'm not talking about other agencies because NICE does not look at the size of clinical benefit, which is very unfortunate. So pretty much if you lower the price enough, you can get through many things and it does happen. However, some drugs, I think exactly on the basis of the issues that you picked up, they didn't go through. And uh, I don't think it's a hundred percent kind of correlation in terms of bad trials uh, still passing through the payers. And um, <clears throat> in the, uh, back to John's issue, huge pressure from patient organizations. Um, they look at anything new as cure and there's no other vision. There's no other explanation. This is the last hope and uh, massive pressure. And you have to understand decision makers that they're very much not on the easy seat. And uh, as a clinician, you know, it's very uh, difficult to be a decision maker. So I, yeah, I think- no, I mean, uh, I don't know whether you have followed this recent FDA ODAC meeting. Uh, FDA uh, gave extra approval to a number of cancer drugs and six of them, uh, failed in the confirmatory trials specifically, like uh, they failed in the primary endpoint. So as a mandate of accelerated approval, you have to revoke the approval if they fail in confirmatory trials. Yeah. But there was so much pressure on the FDA, the FDA could not do it. The FDA asked the industry to voluntarily withdraw the approval, they did not. So they had to take those six drug approvals into an oncology drug advisory committee meeting, or what we call ODAC meeting. And in the ODAC meeting, uh, uh, four of these drugs out of six, the committee members supported continued approval of the drug, even after the drug failed in the confirmatory trial. And, and the logic was uh, some, some of the same logic that uh, you mentioned, like it's an unmet need. Uh, there is no, like the patients need this drug or citing like experience of one patient or oh, one of my patients got this drug and uh, she has been doing fantastic. Uh, so based on those sort of arguments, um, which are not actually evidence-based, um, the FDA has continued to keep the approval for, for these drugs that have already failed in confirmatory trials. So even, even failing in trials is not enough not to get approval nowadays. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So fantastic once again to have you here working together. So one day, hopefully we're on the same mission very much and people who join these uh, events very much on the same mission. So thank you so much, Vishal. Well, thank uh, you very much afternoon. for having me today. Um, everyone else have a good evening. Um, so Vishal, we'll be in touch. So thank you. Yeah, thank hopefully. you, bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Vishal.